All right, the time being 4.30, I'd like to call this meeting of the Economic Development Committee to order and motion. Uh, before we got the agenda, item number four, Bill Snyder, uh, will be moved to the next month. Okay. So, I uh, make a motion to approve it with the uh, change. Is there a second? Second. Dave seconds. Any other uh, comments, questions on, on the agenda? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion period. All right. Uh, next, approve the July 28 minutes. Is there a motion to do so? Tom uh, makes motion to approve the July 28th as a second. Second. No seconds. Any changes to the minutes? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. All right. And again, the bill is, will be moved to next month. So, item number five consider the impact of county marketing cooperative contribution. Chad, you have no information on that. Yep. So, I contacted. Um, Dave Field um, regarding that, and that's the three thousand dollar yearly marketing cooperative investment that I believe in April correct me if I'm wrong that the tourism commission has been paying for. I have no idea how long. Two thousand fifteen. Fourteen. Fourteen. And it sounds like that uh, recently the um, the track in the past has been that it's been more of the tourism type of investment, but now they're changing. Um, they're, they're shifting gears a little bit and changing their efforts a little bit more of the recruitment thing, which does not line up quite exactly with the tourism has been. So that three thousand dollar investment has not been paid for by the city as, as of yet. Um, so I guess we need to determine if, if that's something that the economic development committee um, wants to um, finance to keep that investment going. Um, you'll you'll see the last month they kind of. Uh, detailed some of the things that we can get out of that marketing effort. But um, like I said, it hasn't been paid as of this time by the city. Uh, and Chad and I had some discussions about maybe meeting with the Tourism Commission at their September meeting to discuss a split for that $3,000. Uh, we, we can see their concern that the uh, uh, Money that spells on recruiting works versus other things that uh, doesn't maybe help them um, as much as it helps the city. So I think we'd like to discuss maybe a split with them somehow. The city pick up part of it, and the uh, tourism commission maybe pick up part of it. So we do so. The tourism commission meets in September. Chad's on there. Okay, good. Good. Excellent. So what we would, in, in uh, working, unfortunately, uh, we're under kind of a deadline here to get things in for the budget. And so what we would, uh, Chad and I had talked about was a budget date of 3,000 at this point, but with the anticipation that uh, we will talk with the tourist commission about picking up a portion of that 3,000. So that would be our application. Yep, yep, and we we'll kind of find out next year because it sounded like Dave was saying that the, the board needs to determine what percentage would be tourism compared to what percentage would be recruitment. So they have to determine the uh, that economic development board has to determine what percentage they're planning on in 2021. So at that point in time, we kind of figure out does it make sense? Like, would it be one third tourism and two thirds economic development? And they kind of split up in there. So the recommendation is that we, at this point, include the 3,000 in the 2021 budget as a motion to that effect. Well, do we want to put in the budget or do we want to pay this year's contribution? Because um, that this year's contribution hasn't been paid yet, correct? Okay. Correct. So we're, Mike, still, we're sitting on that yet. I have a question. When yes. did when did they actually move away from it being just tour tourism? As of this year. This year. As of January, or was it partway through the year? Or? I don't know the exact date, but it's just their new role is what they're focusing on. Okay. Because I would take a look at that too if you're going to look at funding it for this year. It'd be interesting to know exactly when that direction changed. Good question. 
think the invoice came out before. So I don't So three thousand is for this year that will be expensed, and also then for the budget. And we in the the committee can decide. You know, are you going to fund the portion that's for recruitment based on you know discussions with the tourism commission in early September, and then kind of go from there. And again, why this is so important. Uh, April 9th, for example, we're meeting with some of the town folks. And one of the people there was from Tyson, what was again mentioned how they were down to their quarters. And they're just having all kinds of problems with work. And almost every business around town to see a sign of window say I'm hiring now. And from an economic development standpoint, unfortunately, we don't have workers here. Uh, we're going to have a real tough time recruiting businesses. And so, even at the county level, that's why the emphasis is changing now, when they're trying to recruit workers. So, to even to keep the existing businesses that they have in the county. And this is important here that the city was trying to, unfortunately, spend money to recruit workers. Uh, there's a lot of things that we learned in Hazard Off, the school and so forth, great parks and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People have to be aware of those things. And the only way we're going to do it is some recruitment that works in the That's small groups. So, anyway, Pat, is there a motion then to uh, proceed with 3,000? John, that's a move. Second. David, seconds. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right. Uh, number six, discuss the 2021 Economic Development Operating Budget. Jack, Judy, this track you. Yep. I'm going to share the screen so you can kind of see what I have here. So Judy and I today went through, uh, just in general, real quick, what the economic development budget has been for the last couple of years. And um, it, it fluctuates so much depending on what project we got going on um, in the past. But um, one of the biggest things for us, I think, moving forward to the 2021 proposed budget is trying to, it's going to be a tight year for a lot of stuff just because of the revenue coming in. And um, there's other expenses that um, insurance is going up or ambulance subsidies going up. So um, the proposed budget that I kind of got right here just basically mimics uh, the 2021, or sorry, the 2020 budget, the bottom line. But I just want to kind of go through what uh, Judy and I kind of talked about today when I kind of found out about some things. So um, you kind of see the first line, the line number five, that's just uh, payments that we have in the budgets with the citizen advisory three members and you guys when you attend meetings. Um, news and subscriptions, that really hasn't been touched much this year, but I'm sure in the past there's been um, some economic development type of, you know, platforms that, have, you know, people have either gone to or uh, have had a fuse with that. Then we get kind of getting the advertising. That line right there currently has spent um, nearly $6,000. That's the Bill Zinert uh, payment right now. That payment is $850 a month. And that's something we can talk about continuing in the future. I did ask him what, how that, I played the, the guy who doesn't really know much what's going on there. So I had him really explain to me what that all entails. And right now, the bill designer cost is $850 per month contribution. $500 of that goes into the series of video campaigns um, that uh, is for the city's portfolio. Um, that's what runs on Facebook, YouTube. Um, he says it geographically targets um, Fox Valley. And then there's one exception that it, it um, Centrally located, there's a centrally located video which promotes New London uh, and to get businesses to relocate. And that video runs statewide, but otherwise, a lot of the other videos that's on the platform runs the Fox Valley area. So, out of the 850, 500 specifically goes to pay those ads that we go on Facebook or YouTube. Those are the ads that uh, just get to run. And the remaining $350 per month, that's his cost to actually do that service. So he said that's uh, for managing, placing the ad, reporting the ad campaign, 
monitoring the key searches, updating the bids, and then the finding of uh, the campaign that will get the basis in place. So that's where that um, advertising right now, and the reason I put that 10200 that would potentially continue the $850 per month for 12 months, and it's a yearly contract. So uh, that's what the 12 or the 10200 comes up to. Land building acquisition and expenses, that's for the um, building at the, um, the old Kirk Barber shop. We own that, and there's some maintenance that's got to be done with that. So, you know, in the past, it's been a thousand or so dollars um, for that per year. So, just kind of estimate a thousand dollars in there. Um, Sundry, that's for things that just come up that we don't know about. So, like in 2018, I found out that um, the 2018 Sundry helped pay for that bike program that's over by the Chamber Building. That's where the water came out the model. Then there's the Wapaka County Economic Development Contribution of 75700 Fox City's Chamber Contribution of 7200 Consultants, that goes up and down every year depending on what's going on. Um, that's where the uh, where Todd's uh, consulting fees would come out of um, this year, um, out of that account. And then the developer assistance expense, that's for the um, Steel King contribution for um, that program that you guys had going on. That drops off next year, and that's the last payment for that, for that contribution. So that, that'll help right there. But you can see the bottom line. I kind of mix up the numbers a little bit to kind of get us to the same you know, bottom line budget for 2021. So based on the programs that um, you guys have done in the past, I mean, the, the Bill Ziner, if you want to do that, if, we didn't, we, if we're going to continue the Wapaka County Economic Development um, membership contribution, the Fox City's membership contribution, I guess at this point in time being, as new as I am in this position, I can't tell you whether or not to do anything yet, just because, you know, I haven't had time to evaluate it. And then whoever the next city administrator is, would probably be the next person to decide whether it's feasible to continue with any of these programs. So I guess my recommendation would just be to stay the course, keep the budget the same for 2021. And, um, you know, there is some money in summary that does come up. You know, you got some program money in there. Um, it just kind of goes from that point. Um, the Fox Chamber Contribution, is that for the regional partnership or is that for a chamber membership? That's for the regional partnership. And that might go back for send an email. Yep. Sure that might go up by percentage. Yep. Yours is budgeted. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, yours is actually budgeted under either mayor or council for the chamber <clears throat> account. One of those. I can't remember at the top of my head right now. What was that, Judy? I said it's either under the cha I think it's under the council or the mayor. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's under the mayor where that those dollars that we help fund with the chamber are under. It's not in here. Okay. Is there a motion to uh, keep the budget the same as we So, at the last meeting, and I contacted the website the other time, and I believe that the regional partnership is discussing that the dues were going to increase, but they were not sure how much. Um, there's some frustration here, and the colleagues are really standing in their budgets right now, so they need to get some more information at the next meeting. Are you talking about your dues, April? No, I was talking about the Fox Cities, the regional partnership. Okay, all right. Are they talking about a large increase? Do you have any any idea what whether did they put out a percent, anything of that nature? No, they were very vague. They had zero okay. information. And this would just be the draft portion of it. This goes into the whole budget process that Judy starts working on, and then to go into budgets like budget you know, workshops and, and that whole thing. So this is just kind of the one little cog that goes into the overall thing that Judy starts putting together. Um, and then it gets massaged even more as the process goes along. So um, I guess I would recommend just leaving the edits for now. So this is more recommendation to the council to 
proceed with those numbers. And Chad was just pointing out once at the council level, the finance will be working those numbers again. We may find out do not support it. We got to that list in there. So we're definitely just cutting at that point. But this would be our recommendation to the council. And if we can't afford it, this is what we're going to do. So Bill makes a motion for a second. Okay, April 2nd. Set. Any further discussion? I just want yeah. to ask this. I've been on this committee the whole time. That's the first time I've really seen a bunch of documents. Yeah. I was always under the impression we had like 10 years. I know we didn't do a board a few years ago, but I think we're looking at a more detailed history if it's available to whoever. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Judy would be the first before my four point in time. I really sure. like to for a detailed history from where things fell under. I'm sure Judy would be willing to sit down with John and have John come sit down with you. You bet. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Tom opposes it. So carried with one. Uh, all right. Uh, Number seven, updates and reports, April. Um, I don't have too much to update you on. I'm sorry, I don't have a printout. I'm trying to save on prints, so I can kind of here. Um, you'll see a lot of activity happening on North Water Street. Um, we have two temp businesses that have been both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party have set up office there until December. Uh, the Republican Party just came in at uh, 300 West North Water Street. It's all run by volunteers. There is a phone number to get a hold of them. And I have those members at the office, in, um, or at the office hours listed at the chamber if anyone has any questions. We've received a couple of phone calls about Island Music over by Walmart. People are asking if it's closed. The building seems to appear that the business is closed, and they are in fact not closed. They have just uh, decreased their hours. Uh, they're currently the only business in that building right now, though. <coughs> uh, we currently have 20 vacant buildings throughout the city of London, and that's 7% vacancy. And not too much else. Unemployment for the state in June was 8.9 and now it's at 7. And it's also gone, not about national. So that's all right. Okay. I'll just take it back on that um, that uh, COVID business um, relief project that we're working on. We've got all the paperwork in for all these businesses. All that paperwork is uh, with April and Judy, and that should come to the next. Council meeting for approval. So that's that process has pretty much been finished and all those checks will be out after the next council meeting. <coughs> Any other comments or questions for April? Hearing none, moving on then uh, to item number eight, select activities and speakers for future meetings. I think with all the other things we got going on, there was because uh, we have potentially a bill coming in, and we still have some budget debates and more comments on and so forth that they might carry over. So I just say we just leave things below for next month. Mm. Unless something important. Unless somebody has something hot to talk about. Once again, here you see none. I think we're ready for the New London Committee of the Whole. And I turn it over to Mayor Mark. Thank you, Dave. We'll, um, 4 50, we'll call the council meeting in the whole to order. The motion to adopt, adopt the agenda. So moved. Motion to make a second. Motion to make a second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? Motion carried. <coughs> Number three, we'll start with Todd Hutchinson. Tom, why don't you come up to the microphone? So. Hello. So uh, I was uh, asked to, to do a final presentation. As you know, um, my contract uh, lasted 90 days, which is really up September 11th. So just the way that the meetings fall out, um, I think that this would be the third uh, presentation on. Uh, Third report essentially from what I found 
in my in my work. Um, the final report that you should have in front of you. And uh, anything that's in red is kind of an update from the last time. So again, the first section really is just a, is an overview of the contract itself or a section of the contract outlines what some of the responsibilities are. And then items in red are things that happened since the last uh, report, uh, just in terms of different things that I've been working on. Um, the next section on page two is really the schedule, just a reminder what the schedule is and where we're at. So we're really at item number three right now, which is uh, within the first uh, nine days um, to do this next report. And then uh, we get to the update. And so um, I think uh, what happened with the last Economic Development Committee was uh, I was uh, directed to reach out to Grant Gist to determine his level of interest uh, in the project. And uh, so I did that and it kind of uh, lays out um, what I found from that uh, from meeting or from talking with him. Uh, first of all, uh, Stephen Rourke, who was his partner, his financial partner, uh, has now been, uh, is now no longer working with, with Grant. So he's kind of out of the picture. Um, Grant has, according to Grant, has secured some new financial partners and is working on completing projects with these new partners uh, in Menasha. Uh, he did say that he has some level of interest. However, uh, quite honestly, he did not seem overly enthused about the project and felt that a number of changes need to be made to the original concept if it even had a chance of succeeding. And what I suggested to him at that time was that he consider it to be a clean slate and that he should propose what he believes will work. Um, so I, I emailed him copies of the market studies that we had back in early October, August, I'm sorry. Um, and then follow up again on August 13th. Uh, at that point, he said that uh, they were digging into it, pencilling out different approaches. But he also said that they have 28 other active projects and are slowly working their way through all of them. Um, at that time, he said they had a team meeting and have some would get back to this feedback. I didn't hear anything until about a week later, follow up again. Um, and he did say that he's still, you know, penciling now to scope and spec of the project. Um, he, he, he did say that he figured out, though, that having the library as part of the project would make a more successful project. This is direct code in the email. Um, so I follow up again on August 20th, asking for some additional information to let him know that I had this meeting today, and whether or not he could at least elaborate on the other new investors that he has. And uh, I haven't heard back from him at this point uh, from that standpoint. So that's sort of where I'm at with Grant Fisk in terms of following him. Um, also at that um, economic development committee meeting, um, Mayor had asked me that I compile a list of other potential developers for the site. And uh, I, I did tell Grant that we were, you know, that I was ready to do that. And I was also working on that as well, just to let him know that we were looking at other options at the same time. Um, I do have a list, partial list, at any rate, yeah, that I've yeah, uh, yeah, compiled yeah. and I sent it over to Chad this morning. There's some other things that I'd still like to, some of the phone numbers and uh, a few other things I'd like to finish adding on that, but I, I'll definitely have that in by September 11th. But, fine. but there is a, there's a partial <laughs> list right now if anybody wants to take a look at it and start it on that list. Or has anybody that they want to add to our list? Um, Chad had sent over a great contact with Swinderski out of uh, Mosley. Um, they've done some, some interesting work um, in smaller communities, um, Apaca and some other smaller communities around here. So they're on the list. There's also uh, somebody who brought up Tom Hugh. He's on the list. It's, it's, it's quite a extensive list right now we'll keep adding to that and uh, decide what we're going to do with it i guess once the list is clear um the third thing then was to uh, review the two market studies that were um that were completed for new london one was an initial condominium study uh that was done actually initiated by stan Mueller, 
Um, so that's two years old. And then there was another market study that was completed just of the uh, multifamily housing. And it was really, it was sort of an interesting study that looked at uh, not only sort of demand for housing, the growth of the city, but also how the city compared to other similar sized cities around the state. So um, I looked at those two uh, different studies. Um, so the first one, the condo study, was completed in July of 2018 for Randy. Um, basically, it was saying that if you go down, if the, if the city of New London could support two condominium units per year, and that could go down as low as one unit per year, or perhaps as high as four condo units per year. Per year. And then followed up with a phone call to Neil Masadi, who's the author of the study, and he described the uh, described it verbally to me as being anemic. He thought that that was a pretty anemic um, demand for condominiums in the city of London. The other thing though that I talked to him about was, well, you say that the city can support two condominiums per year. What does that mean? Is that, that kind of, is that $500,000 condominium or is that $100,000 condominium? And it's one of the interesting things about these studies that we've done, we really don't look so much at the, at the product. The end, they, they don't have an end product in mind. They're really kind of just looking more at history of condos that have come up for sale in, in New London and how long it's taken to, to sell those and to turn, turn them around. So I think obviously the part of that demand has to do with product yeah. that you're producing. So if you're producing a really high quality product at a very um, you know, value at a rate that's um, inexpensive, um, you could probably do you know yeah. higher yeah. or oh. four condos are higher. Um, but if it's something that's going to be um, you know, maybe not as competitive a product, it's going to be harder to sell those products. Um, the second thing then was the multifamily housing study, and that was just completed in July 2020. Um, you know, one of the, what it talked about was that household growth was projected to 27 households per year over the next 10 years, and uh, it's also stated that London, in their opinion, could absorb 100 rental units over the next 10 years. And it was in any combination of the units that were listed below that. So, because that was one of the things that was a little confusing to me when I read the market study. It said in one area that you could support 100 rental units in 10 years. And then it also said, well, you could support 90 family tax credit units, 60 family market rate units. Or if you add those all up, it's more than 100. Uh, so I did talk with him about that and he said, well, Really, you can probably support 100, but um, it would be any combination of those. So maybe 60 family market rate and uh, 40 senior family or senior market rate would be like one example of one combination that he thought uh, could happen. He also, um, he also did state that the tax credit units, because um, they're high quality uh, product, at a very affordable rate. Generally speaking, they're really not even looking so much at, um, not really looking so much at vacancy in the city, they're more looking at just growth and, and population growth and things like that to determine whether or not tax credits uh, are supportive, tax credit units are supportive, um, which I thought was, was kind of interesting. Um, the next thing was that uh, they did talk about that ages uh, 45 and under are declining. Um, so the population of people that are age 45 and under is actually declining in the city of New London. It has been declining for some time. And they, they believe that it will continue to decline based on, on projections. Um, the uh, next point, which is on the top of page four, is that ages 55, people that are ages or household age 55 and over are increasing over the past 20 years. And they project that that will continue to increase 
over the next 10 years, and then decline as well as a matter of people passing away. And, so that's why we need that decline after. So um, there's a total population decline actually starting in 2030. Um, one of the things that I felt was really the most interesting, maybe a little disturbing uh, in this part of the market study was that we brought up that London is underperforming compared to the peer communities that we had in that study in attracting and growing business. And uh, in that study, it found the jobs in London have actually been declining since 2000. Um, and so the reason why they felt that, that was important, obviously, because if you have jobs, even though I know you say you have jobs now, there's evidence that the, that the employers here now can't even find workers to work, but the fewer jobs that you have, uh, the less demand that there is for housing in the community. Um, the next point is just that uh, I spoke to Dale over the phone. Um, and one of the things that Dale did say that he was willing to come speak to the committee, which I don't know if you might find interesting or not. Um, but he does get very busy with market studies between now and December for tax credit projects. So it would almost have to be like well, nearly immediately or wait until the new year. But I think that some of his comments just about um, population growth and housing demand, he just knows a lot about it across the straight state. It might be interesting for, all, for you all to hear directly from him, um, his thoughts on that. You know, he brought up that he thinks in London has many great things going for it. So number one, how many times set the schools, proximity to Appleton, especially with the highway expansion, the river, the parks, the other amenities, um, shopping and the hospital, which is really you know, unique for a community of this size to have its own hospital. Um, it's also a somewhat attractive and intact down, downtown. Um, and some very attractive residential neighborhoods that are close to their downtown. Um, the two biggest negatives um, have been one is inability to attract and grow businesses, and the general phenomenon of rural areas losing population in more urban and suburban areas. So that second one is something that you know, we can't do much about in terms of society as trend, other than um, you know, we were talking about earlier, just whatever you can to market in London because you're competing against these other areas to make New London to show up to New London's attributes and, and uh, make sure that people understand how attractive it is to live. Um, one of Dale's initial comments to me, and we talked about this in I think maybe the last economic development um, committee meeting, was that the chicken and an egg phenomenon of the market studies, right? And we talked about this that yeah, the market study is looking at sort of a snapshot in time and it's looking at historic, right? So historically, um, you know, losing population, the population is aging, and losing, losing you know, younger population, or it's just, it's just aging and not being replaced with younger folks. And so you can build to um, sort of accommodate what's happened historically and what's being projected based on that historical um, data. Or you can try and change it, right? You can try and decide, well, this is who we, even, yes, this is where we've been, this is where it looks like we're going, but we want to change it. We want to bring in more and more folks. And so then it's a matter of, um, of developing plans and developing product that younger people want to come, uh, come and use. And so um, that's sort of the chicken and egg thing is that if all of a sudden now you've generated these products and you're bringing people in, all of a sudden it sort of feeds on itself and the market study will now say, oh, well, you're, you know, you're growing with this and there's a projection for more because they kind of look at what you've done and then they project off of that for the market study. So I do think that and as we talked in about some of the other meetings, I think we have to look at um, not only what the reality is right now, but also the reality, also where it is that you want to go, and what it is that you want to accomplish. 
this and then develop a plan that gets you there. And that's also, I think, one of the ways that you know, bringing people in like Dale would be helpful to understand maybe what these you know, younger families or younger individuals um, are looking for in their housing option. You know, they may be able to help direct um, direct how you formally get funded. Um, at the last, so that's really kind of um, what I found from the market studies. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about that or if you have questions at the end, but um, then after, after my last uh, subcommittee meeting of this group, maybe, maybe a week ago, um, they asked that I come up with some final steps or some additional steps that I thought would make sense um, to take a look at. And so one of those things, I think first, and we talked about this at one of the other committee, committees as well, is um, I think it really is necessary for the library to be able to move forward to have, to understand what that financial commitment is from the city so that they, they have the ability um, to make some plans and to, to work on things a little easier uh, if they understand what that is. And whether that's total dollar amounts, dollars plus other in-kind commitments, land infrastructure, or if it's a percentage of the total cost plus certain down amount. And I do think that that's, it sounds like that's one of the next things on the agenda. So that's moving in. Uh, to, to develop a TIP or TID program for the site. And uh, that's so that when developers are interested in the site, you already have an agreed upon approach for providing incentive to developers. So they know coming in, while well, they can get to up to a certain amount based on a percentage of the product or project or whatever formula you use. And I know during one of the last meetings that I attended here, uh, Judy is already working on that. So I think that's in the works and I think it's a good step. Um, I think, you know, a third one, and I said this before, is that I really believe that it's imperative that the city makes a more concerted effort to market not only the riverfront site, but also all the city owned lands available for redevelopment, including the existing business parks. Um, and that can be done either by hiring, hiring an outside entity, like a real estate broker, or by hiring somebody in house um, to, to develop the marketing and to do that work and to. Uh, make those contacts with this list of developers that we're putting together. And that list has to get updated and added to, and you know, people move, people leave, they come and go. And one of the things that I think you, know, you have to realize is that, like we're talking, I was talking about Grant Tips, you know, he's got 28 projects actively looking at working. Well, everybody's looking at it, right? And it depends on the state of the economy at any given time. Right now, the kind of the COVID things going on, the time is still hot, interest rates are really low. Um, so real estate development, I mean, people have a lot of different things that they're looking at and moving at. It may drop down where people don't have as, as much to look at, or things get too busy and too hot and overheated, where stuff is too expensive to be working on. Or you know, one of the big problems now is actually construction materials. So things are constantly changing. And just because you hear a no once from somebody, from some developer, or they seem like they have a lack of interest or something, doesn't mean that they're not going to have interest a month from now or six months from now or a year from now. And that's part of why it has to be a constant and continual, um, almost a drip, drip, drip of, hey, don't forget about us. You've got to almost be the squeaky wheel of, don't forget about us. We have this here. This is our, and now you're going to have this is our incentive. Not only do we have it here, but look, this is uh, the next point talks about kind of what we want, but um, here's the incentive that we have. Not only do we have this land, but we also have this incentive and we're ready to go. Um, so I think that that's helpful to just to keep that, that drip out there. And it's part of anybody that does marketing knows that you have to keep it going yeah. because you have to yeah. see it. Know multiple times before it actually before it actually hits. Um, so then the, the next um, it, and uh, I guess on the same point is that it's just not only developers either. You know, it's architects, engineers, um, 
appraisers, attorneys, anybody that's involved, involved in real estate may know somebody that at any given time they have an interest in, in doing something. Uh, the fourth thing, I guess, is consider working with an urban planner or someone to develop some, a couple of site plans options for the site. So I think that that would also be helpful. I think it would be helpful in a couple of ways. I think it would be helpful for you to sort of formulate what it is that you'd like to see on the site, you know, to be able to see what the options are if you divide that site up into multiple small parcels that are, you know, somebody at one point thought up the idea of like the mini homes or, or micro housing, you know, what would that look like, small housing there? What would it look like if it was just a portion of the site? What would it look like if you divided up into small ones? What would it look like with some multi-story buildings? So to have a few different options for people to look at, spark ideas. One thing that I've always kind of been curious about on this site is would it make, part of it has to do with infrastructure, but would it make sense to actually have a drive with parking on either side along the Riverwalk Trail? So that that's down there, um, right along the river. Um, so you could park on both sides. People would be, would activate the river, go down, park, the, the walk along the trail, and then also uh, maybe be part of whatever other development was on that site. So it'd be interesting to see that sort of an option, and then an, an option divided up into multiple smaller sites, and then a, a third option is maybe one larger development that doesn't have any uh, interior uh, uh, roads and things like that. So looking at a few different options like that would be helpful. I think it also would be helpful as you're sending this out to developers and other interested parties to say, here are some options um, that we're open to any, any of these things. Um, the good thing that I'm seeing in terms of steps is to determine the types of housing and businesses that you would like to attract to this community. Um, are you going to try? Are you going to serve the aging community that you know that is maybe happy right now and is continuing to grow? So is that what we want to do? We want to go for younger single folks in one bedroom type apartments, ones and twos, or do you want to go with younger families that maybe have uh, twos and three kinds of bedrooms, maybe smaller townhomes kinds of things? So looking at those options and then also. Um, taking a look at what business or industry might be lacking, uh, whether it's on that site or maybe in the industrial park. But what, what do you have here now that could be that's an asset that you could bring more um, businesses similar to that? <coughs> and also, what don't you have that you would like to see here brought here and then you know, do some direct targeting um, to those businesses? Um, the sixth one I already talked about is consider having a market study provider come in um, just to, to give a presentation. Um, seven is to uh, <coughs> is to reach out to local existing businesses to determine their level of new employee needs, what type of housing their employees are looking for, look into down payment. This is something that we talked about at the last meeting that. Um, I've worked in other communities, like in Milwaukee, as an example, and they have uh, what was called the Walk to Work program with um, Northwestern Mutual Life and Harley Davidson. There's a number of large corporations that um, actually put some money into a pot, and it was operated by a nonprofit, but um, they would then give out down payment assistance grants uh, to people that were interested in buying in their neighborhood, in the Harley Davidson neighborhood. In a middle neighborhood, and they had an specific neighborhood for one. I could see where that would be done for the entire city of New London, or let's say to Tyson, maybe they, or whoever. Uh, maybe they're willing to put some money in. This money goes in, and it's for their employees specifically, or as they're recruiting people, they can say, Look, this is one of the advantages of coming here and living here is you get some down payment assistance. It can either be a grant 
or it could be, you know, I've done some of these programs where it's a, it's a loan that um, stays on the books as a second loan, and then if they ever sell and move away, that money gets paid back and get that pool. So there's kind of a revolving thing where it can be used again. So it could be done for that. And then as I was putting this together, I thought, well, it wouldn't have to just be for down payment. It could also be for, as an example, security deposits. And that would be something that we could provide the security deposits for potential tenants in different coming from London. And then when they left, we would get that security deposit back, go back in. But doing something like that with local businesses can help. I think it's important to find out. I already heard some of the page said that ISIS is saying that they're down 100 employees and need that. So, we're talking to all of them to find out what they need and what they think they need uh, to attract business or employees. Um, Nate, aid is something we already talked about that we're working on. It's just to develop a list of real estate developers and other professionals to target on a consistent basis. And then have somebody that's available to do that targeting. Um, so that would be aid. Uh, number nine is, uh, is to investigate with VITA and or WEDC or other programs, like federal and big, uh, to find out what other programs are available to get to assist with housing and business development in the area. Um, I, I did forward over, it's kind of a little late now, but where VITA right now has a rural um, workforce housing initiative. It's a pilot program that we're selecting three communities across the entire state to, uh, to look at, and they're putting $10 million in these three communities. It's divided up amongst the three uh, to go towards workforce housing. And uh, so, but to be aware of those, um, those potential programs that become available, whether it's to rural development, Rita, or some of the other state agencies, um, to bring and even to bring them in and talk with folks who you know, talk with folks who really know to see what they can do to help um, to assist you in, in developing these sites. Um, the last one was really, and I brought this up the last meeting, to support the existing local businesses and the existing real estate owners in town. Um, I think somebody else early on had said there was a concern about you know, putting a bunch of money into the riverfront site and it would really take away from money that could be spent in existing businesses helping them here and now fix up their um, restore funds or make other improvements. And to the extent that you can help those existing businesses, I think um, will make the downtown more attractive. Um, or just the city in general on track um, and we'll strengthen them. So I, I don't think we can forget about the existing business owners that are that have put a lot of their own sweat and blood and equity into projects. Um, we have to be mindful of them as we're trying to move forward and bring more people in. So those are really the 10 uh, kind of next steps that I thought about. Um, they're certainly not all inclusive. There are these things that are off the top of my head that I thought would be sort of next steps. And there might be some things that other people in this group or the council might have some different ideas to add to that you know, or take away. So, so that was that. Um, I guess you know, just to finalize, my contract does terminate on September 11th. Um, so I I will work on finishing up the list of developers. I'll continue to follow up with Grant. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else that you all want me to do before then. I can go on, I can, I can work on that. Um, and I think finally, just, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to assist them to redevelop this site. I think it's an extremely important site. And, uh, I hope that I've been able to answer some of the questions, at least in terms of the you know, where we're at with standing the proposal and um, where we're at so far and where the next possible steps are.
So that's it. Have any questions or concerns? Yeah. Yeah. You think you're going to have to have uh, a kill to do the project? Yeah. Yes. I think, I mean, there's projects in the, in the city. For infrastructure. I don't, I don't even think for infrastructure. Um, when we talk to Scott from Verizon, as an example, um, he was typically looking for, and he, Verizon does a lot of projects. They're looking for a 50% um, city contribution, whether that's a TIF or outright grants, and not for the infrastructure, but for the, for the project itself. And then um, that's on tax credit projects. On market rate, they're looking for anywhere from 20 to 25%. And he talked about you know, the project that they're doing right now in Jamesville. Uh, they're getting three. Might have been here and some of the other was in one of the reports, but um, but they're looking at twenty percent. I think it was in Janesville uh, too. And you just you look at and it, it's a. I mean, it may not be right, but it's just the fact that it's kind of like all the sports teams that when they come in, they can they're coming in and they're having cities, communities compete against one another. Um, to bring their sports franchise in. And you may not like it, you may not be right, but it's part of what the market is right now. Um, in order to get development to occur, your demand is subsidy. It doesn't matter. It's, I mean, Appleton, you look at any of the downtown projects that have to be on up there. Oshkosh, Milwaukee, uh, Madison. Madison is, you know, the hottest market in the state, probably. Most all of the different in the project and it's just it's a factor of um, rising costs uh, and i guess i guess the, uh, the rents and where the sale price is not um, competing not keeping up and, and it's especially true in london where we're in a community like in london where your costs really aren't that much different, right? I mean, the cost for a two by four in the London is not much different than the cost for a two by four in Apple. But the rents and the sale prices are much less than Apple. And as a result, you're going to have, if you want that development, it's going to be Thank you, John. You laid out pretty nice step by step process for us to follow on that. Any other questions? Yeah. Look at Jeff. We are the ones taking the chance. The other units of government are. If we don't go good, we'll take the lot. It depends on how they can be. It depends on how it's set up. Now, that's the way it used to always be, right? But the tips that I've seen now, uh, tip for the most part, although Scott did say that Jamesville was doing a City fund. So there's a difference between the city funding the tip and the developer fund, uh, funding the tip. And what happens is, um, if the city provides the money up front, let's say that the city is going to provide a million dollars. In the past, what would happen is the city would go out, borrow that million dollars, give it to the developer. The developer would develop whatever it was they're developing, and the taxes that were generated from that development. Then supposedly you would pay back to the city and to, to repay that tip, right? Right. But what happened then a lot, of, not a lot of times, but often sometimes, um, the taxes were never enough to pay off the tip. And so then you're right, the, the city was on the tax. Right. One of the ways that cities got around that now is to say, well, we'll do a tip here. But you developer, you have to go out and you have to borrow. Okay. So um, say Scott as an example wanted a million dollar tip. He had to go out, borrow it from a bank a million dollars. And then what happens is <laughs> the taxes that he generates um, that go to the city, the city pays him whatever percentage back out of it, because normally it's not a hundred percent. Could be eighty percent of the taxes that generated. It paid back to him, and he uses that to pay off that loan that borrowed. And if it isn't enough, he's on the hook. The loan is to him; it's not to the city. 
And so that's, um, those are called PAYGO tips or developer funded tips, but that's one way to avoid, and that's the way most communities, in my understanding, have gone now to avoid the risk of getting on that credit. And that's the way I would recommend that you do it as well. I mean, I mean in the last um, in the last proposal that Scott had done, I think that they were looking for $1.2 million as an example in that proposal. But his project only supported like seven hundred or $750,000 of that $1.2 million. So that was one where, yeah, the city was on the hook for that extra. And that's a decision that the city has to make, right? Is it important enough that you want to take that risk and be on the hook that you're going to have to raise money for the general fund, for the taxes, and whatever it's paid for? But the other way you can look at it is, is just to say, no, we're not going to do that one because you're asking too much. You're going to have to guarantee it and go out and get a loop. Because the other way that you can do it is the city can, can go out, borrow the money. And then they can still get a guarantee from the developer um, that it would short the developer has to come up with the difference. And that's what that's what James was actually doing with Scott on this more recently. Even though and the reason why you do it that way is because the municipality can borrow and get the money at a lower rate than what the developer can. So if the chip money goes a little bit further, um, but obviously there is some. Did, there's still some risk to the city because you're only got the guarantee from the developer. And the we'll follow up with some of that with uh, the prime minister. Any other questions? Well, maybe I have to uh, steps here. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. Todd, you just uh, made kind of an interesting point about how the the cost of a two by four may be the same here as it is in Appleton, but the developer can get more of a return in Appleton because they can charge higher rents. Are there uses of this space that you think would be more attractive to a developer or less attractive to a developer? In other words, are we, do you have recommendations as to how that space might be most attractive to somebody? Is it as commercial space, residential, or some other use that we haven't thought of? Is there a way we can leverage that particular space to make it perhaps more attractive than building the same thing in Appleton? Well, I think, I think from um, well, one of the ways that it's more attractive than developing in the London, you know, one of the ways that a municipality can make things more attractive is by reducing, by making it an easier process, right? They go through the process. So the easier the process, the quicker you can make. And I think that that's quite honestly one of the things that has frustrated some of the previous developers is that things have sort of drug on, right? And as things drag on, time is money and, and time fills all deals. And so the quicker that you can make decisions and clear up red tape for developers, that's going to put you um, at a advantage, right? Because if you have to run through a lot of red tape and a lot of zoning, you know, jump through a lot of hoops, and uh, that that's going to be one different set of ways between looking at applicants where you're most likely going to have to do that versus in London where maybe you shouldn't have to do that. You should be able to be more nimble. You should be able to be quicker to be able to make decisions and to offer incentives quicker, those sorts of things. So that's one way that I would say to make it different. In terms of the actual product that you're producing, um, I, I am not an expert on all sources of housing or all sorts of real estate. My, you know, my, quite honestly, my background, my experience is in tax credit, affordable housing tax credit. That's where the bulk of my experience is. So I don't pretend to know um, how different developers, like whether it be retail or hotel developers or uh, even market rate housing developers, office developers, 
how they look at all of these things. And that's why I've sort of been an advocate for um, getting it out there, getting this site out as available to all of those different parties, because maybe somebody sees something that we don't, and they may just have an interest. And like I said earlier, maybe they didn't have an interest six months ago or a year, but now they do. And so I think it's more important that. Now, having said that, I do think that just globally, there's some things that just aren't working right now, right? Like hotels aren't working. It's a huge problem. Restaurants even aren't working right now. I think it would be lovely to have a restaurant on that site on the river, but restaurants in period are having a hard time. There's going to be, I'm saying that 60% are going to go out of business uh, by the time this whole COVID thing is done. We, we may be better in these areas than some of the other more urban areas, but um, so those aren't working well. Offices, uh, there's tends to have been a huge cut. So really the thing that um, um, there seems to still be a demand for is, is, is housing. And I would think that um, in terms of in terms of what is, is more interesting here is the uh, is single is like a townhome real, real house style, those types of one story. One story slab on grade row house style houses are probably the easiest uh, to sell and develop with the, with the least risk. I just don't know if that's what you want um, on that site. That's the, the highest and best use at this point. So it's a difficult thing, I think. And that's why I guess I keep advocating that you get it out to a lot of different people and see what else, see what comes in. Thanks, Jim. Any further questions? Yeah. My point was, uh, where do we go from here? Todd, uh, Todd has identified 10 or so steps. Unless we start taking some action six months from now, you're going to know the same spot there. It seems to me we have to hire somebody. The uh, city administrator passed 25% of their time, theoretically, was, to go, was devoted to this type of work. Uh, it's been a period of time now where I'm not sure that uh, we've got a lot accomplished with the city of this year's time. Maybe it's time to look for other alternatives. Maybe we'll hire some like modern communities, for example, have a planner or other person on board that they pay 50, 60, 70,000 a year to do the things that Todd uh, has laid out. And uh, so, particularly at this point, we bring a new city administrator on board. Have time to be caught up with just personnel matters and so forth. Are we going to get a lot of work done in the marketing area and so forth? Or are we better off to start looking for either a part time person? I know Todd would be willing to work part time for us or somebody like Todd, or uh, maybe a full time planner for a period of years. I think that's something that's what it calls us here tonight. So we need to make decisions on this move forward. I agree. We need to, to to move forward. I think I've heard eleven years we've been working on this. Any suggestions? Any more comments? Yeah, I I do want to sell the property, but I don't want to pay. I don't want to pay millions to get rid of it. Even just from the last month, you know, the pocket of just the city John, it's really hard to hear you, and I'm not sure why, but all, we can't hear you at all. Or I can't anyway. I don't know if anybody else can. But. I can't either. Um, I just want to say I agree with Dave that we we don't just kick the can down the road again today and leave here and forget this presentation from Todd. I, I think we need to either 
look at maybe retaining Todd to keep us in that next mm-hmm. step. So we don't just kick this can down the road again, or we can come up to the table and say we need an mm-hmm. economic development person as a staff for the city, or we need to, we're out of time when we're looking at administrator turnover. Um, we need to, we need to not kick the can one more block down the road, or it's going to end up in the river. That's just my thought. I agree with Dave, and I really want to thank Todd for all this time he's put into this and his ability to explain it in a way that I have, I certainly can appreciate how he explained it to us. That's my thought. Thank you, John. Line three, we're we're looking at down. Uh, the downtown riverfront project, the next steps, and obviously we just got Todd's report. So we're, we're looking at the next steps to go on. Well, if you look down at number four, it's discuss financing and site development options. Uh, them two are just tying right together, so I'd like to, to move on to item four, if nobody else has any more questions for Todd. We hear none, we'll, we'll uh, move to item four and we will bring down the next steps that we want to move forward with as well. I think uh, all kinds of tied in together. We're talking about budget and uh, where we want to move on from here. Um, with, with item four, discussion of financing site development options for downtown riverfront property, I'd like to start out with, with Judy. So uh, at the last meeting, I was tasked with coming up with um, some guidelines or a TIF policy um, that the committee would take a look at and decide um, what you were looking at for the site, objectives, do you want agriculture, food and beverage, you know, what exactly are you looking for to go on to this site? And once I started doing research, I I have a number of... um, TIF guidelines and TIF policies um, that I found. But in particular, I found one that was about four pages long. And when Todd was talking about ease of process, when I looked at this one, I thought that this was going to be the best um, guideline for the city of New London. Um, And that way when a developer would come in, we would have a simple process. Some of these were 20 pages long explaining what a TID district was or a TIF district was. So a developer would have to go through all of this information before at the end of it, they would figure out how, how in the heck am I supposed to even begin this process? Um, But then when I got the actual TIF guidelines, I thought it would be much simpler for us not to go through this item by item in a committee level. But um, I did actually send this out to Dave has it, the mayor has it, uh, Chad has it right now. Um, But it would be nice to have at least another eye or um, maybe one of the committee members come in. Maybe Hans, you want to come take a look at it. but it specifically lists um, what is the purpose of our TID district? What are the objectives? Um, what is our implementation projects? How are we gonna finance this? I'm gonna tell you that right now I'm going to um, push the pay as you go or pay go to financing. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this at the last committee meeting, I did explain to you um, all of the projects that the city is looking for um, and that we do have a maximum amount of dollars that we can bond for. So instead of pitting that development against a road project, we to work through this with developer, developers as a pay as you system. Um, and I think that is going to be the way that I'm going to recommend. Doesn't mean that's what you have to do. Um, but as part of the, the policy, I would recommend that that's what we look at. Um, and then there's a short paragraph on how do I apply for this TIF assistance? Um, what is my TIF process? And there's only seven bullet points on this one. Um, and then eligible types of development. These are the types of development we want to see on that site. Um, and then eligible expenses, um, eligible, um, and then TIF assistance and criteria. And it, and it just has three items under there. But I'm not sure in a big group like this that that's the ideal place to hash out the, the um, 
what this one's this is to look like. I think we could list a number of things um, within that small group, especially for the objectives, and we could put, put a list of 20, and then at the next meeting, we can just cross them out. Nope, 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 yes, yes, yes. And then I could update it, and then we can implement um, the TIF guidelines. And at this point, we don't have a developer. I can't see that we're in really that much of a hurry. I didn't think this had to be absolutely done tonight. So that's where I am at with this TIF guideline process um, and the financing. Any questions for Judy? I have, I have a question. Dave brought up retaining somebody like Todd to help us keep moving forward. Where, where are you feeling about that in our budget? Are you, are you talking to me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I guess um, I'm going to go full circle back to Todd. And there was a point where he actually said that he would help us through this process and he wouldn't get paid unless he found a developer or something um, to be developed through that site, on that site. So my question to Todd would be, are you still willing to work with the city I mean, literally, as you know, the, the, he wouldn't get paid unless he found someone. I know there was some other um, individuals involved in that conversation, um, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how that went. But I know Todd himself said that he was inter interested enough. Um, I don't know if it was the challenge of it all or what, but Todd was definitely interested in um, putting in a lot of work with with a back end pay. So. My question would be, Todd, are you still interested in that? That's what I, that would be my suggestion. Todd, would you like to approach council and comment? Um, that that proposal was was based on working directly with um, a, a realtor, and I think. Uh, I'm not sure that I'd be interested in it. I definitely am not interested in doing it at all. Um, I really think that it needs to have a larger staff that can um, disseminate the information. You know, and that, you know, like, like the realtor that I was looking at, and I'm sure most, a lot of, not, but a lot of realtors will have this ability to, um, you know, they have email programs, they have contact lists to do the automatic, you know, constant contact, all that kind of stuff. It goes out with different people. And I just don't have that. You know, that software, and I don't have me personally. One of the time, there's better things to be doing than that kind of thing. Um, so, I would, if I were to do it, I would want to work with somebody again that would be like whether it was Keller Williams, by I really brought in, or some other um, real estate. And I think uh, in one of my comments that I said, you could either hire in-house uh, to do this or you know to bring on a real estate company to do this but i think you should need to be very specific about what you expect because I, we all know that you can hire a real estate company and what happens is it goes up on mls and it just sits there and they don't really do any other market right and then you can have others that are going to be putting up signs and doing i think it's going to take more than just putting it on commercial websites, you know, it's going to have to be a, a constant sort of little barrage of people every so often that this is what's available. And then the other piece of that is that um, I think you know, there would also have to be you know, there's some expense in which you've already been willing to pay for like the market study, but I do think that there probably would be some expense in coming up with some sort of the site plans for it that we envision what could possibly be there that would also help with that marketing piece of it that would cost a little bit of money. And um, so I, I'm not I can't I'm not gonna give you an answer tonight, but I definitely know that I would want it to go longer I want to be in partnership with at least another uh, real estate project. Thank you, Dad. I don't. I don't think we're ready to make a decision on that tonight, anyway. So it'll be something in the future that we come back to. Thank you. 
any further discussion in that area? I guess so. If he's going to work with another broker, how long does he expect to have a listing? We'll, we'll have to, once we figure that out, that's a, a good question. Yeah, I think, you know, what we had proposed initially was two years. And I think that that's, I still think that that would be a amount of time. You need that kind of commitment. In order to do, you know, a bunch of free work and late work, you need to know that it's not going to be cut out in front of you in you know, three months, six months, or even a year. And we all know how long this is going to be. This isn't going to be a quick process. It hasn't been so far. There's no magic bullet for it. It's a lot of hard work. And... So I think we need to have a commitment to get it done. But I also, you know, in my original proposal, I, I know the realtor wasn't going to go along with this, but I always thought that, you know, if you're unhappy with us at any time, you should be able to have a, a way of getting out of that. But I also think there should be some level of commitment on this. I feel that, that we've learned a lot. That's helped us a lot. If would we be, would you be, would you be willing to do another stint of time while we were gathering our thoughts? It would be, it would be nice if things didn't just regress or, or halt. And, and I know we can't make that decision now, but if we decided that we would like to extend this, your knowledge and help us, you know, is that something that you would be interested in? And that was the last one, three months, you said? Yeah, it's really supposed to end on September 11th, so there's still some time here now. There's, uh, like I said, I want to keep working on a list of developers and working on grants if you want for me, just so I can start reaching out to some of these developers as well. But I get it, it would be nice to have some direction of which way you all want me to, to go, um, but I'm, I'm willing to continue to put some time in. Thank you. So that's September 11th, does that bring us up? That doesn't bring us up to our next meeting, does it? You extend it out to the 29th? Thank you, Todd. So we have we have that. We have time to discuss and month to figure out what we're going to do up until that point if we retain somebody where it's in issues out. Um, brings us up to the next thing. What do we want to develop down there? What, what does this committee want to see in that area? We have to know, and Todd said it a couple times, what are we what are we going to look at here? What kind of a group are we looking at? He highlighted it in here. Are we going to stay with what are we doing? projections are and, and grow older as a community? Are we going to, well, here's my the favorite quote out there is, is B is <clears throat> chicken and the egg phenomenon, market studies. If you build what the market study suggests, you get more of what the market study suggests. Versus if you build what you want, you may or may not be able to attract what you want. What do you guys want? Where do we want to go? That's correct. I think in order to support our employers right now, we have to start retaining younger folks. When we talked to Tyson, they listed off a laundry list of why they can't retain their employees, and one of them was housing security. You know, people come in and think that they can commute and they can get any energy that work. I think that was on our top three. I agree. You start looking in our community there. Uh, I'm going to say two, three years ago, you couldn't throw a stone without getting four or five houses for sale. Now you look out there, you're going a couple blocks, three, four blocks, the houses for sale aren't, aren't there like they were. Is that what creating our availability of having nothing to move into? I've been looking for four rent signs, all over the place, next to nothing. So is that what is stopping people from coming here, like you said, out of these businesses? I can say from a chamber standpoint, too, we are getting people from homes of uh, trying to find housing rental. 
that it's the availability is just not right not there right now. And then on top of that, I've also talked to about people that during the COVID, the people that do have these rentals, they're not showing them. Uh, houses are on virtual tours and stuff, so it's it's kind of a time crunch. But there, I, there's like you said, you don't see them; they're not available. So, as a group, where where do we want to go? If we had to suggest to bring in the, you know, towards the newer, younger age. Is that a overall feeling? I, I guess I would say I lean that way and I lean towards what Abel said. Um, but I think I brought up some really good points. Um, we may need to look at working with your planner to kind of final what we, what we would like to see down there. But yeah. We know two things. I brought up another thing. We have property all over the city. Not just the downtown river side. Um, and so if we want to look at attracting a certain age group or workforce retention, we need to look at the whole big picture and then understand that river front site as we understand what we want to attract to the big picture to all of our property. And the other thing that was interesting that not mentioned is that um, down payment or the, um, even even mentioning the uh, security deposit help to corporate maybe sponsors and whatnot, but that ties directly into what Gabriel and Dave put a lot of time in on the transportation issue, and it, it's it's true. Less people are driving, and driving to work is an issue, and eventually, now I know that the trends in the market study right now. And the price of the two by four and that's been the same here. The rent is higher than that. Guess what, folks? Given the pandemic situation, people are trying to get away from big cities. We're talking like high piper rates. And that's going to even create a bigger demand on our housing here. And so that's I just feel that I agree with April and we have brought up a lot of good points. I personally I'll put lean towards housing. And um, and it's not just the riverfront property, it's our, mm -hmm. all of our property we have. Whether it's fixing some lighted neighborhoods into desirable neighborhoods, anyway, we're gonna fill them up. You know, that's the market right now. People need a place to live outside of a big city. So census moving forward is we're looking at housing, not commercial properties. Looking at housing. Then second, to add to that, are we going to look at developing the whole property as one, or do we want to progressively develop it? I think we'd be open to we should be open to progressive. I always thought that. To the uh, front part facing the river, kind of what Randy had put in this map here really appealed to me that we may have some good townhouses that we couldn't get knocked out of for facing the river, but behind those then be a bunch of condoms or whatever the lower uh, affordable housing behind them, uh, next to between that and the road and so forth. Uh, but the, so if we would split that off. And, and uh, that section we could build today. Uh, well, both sections we could build today, but maybe look at, at piecemeal as one of the alternatives that, that Todd had talked about. Kind of like what Randy laid out, where we had some good higher price townhouses space the river, because I always felt there's only a limited amount of river frontage available. And I think even what the library group found was that there was a waiting list of people going ready, willing to buy. People like myself, uh, our age group, I'm willing to pay half dollar for a good house. I'm reaching the age where I can't mow anymore. I don't need to maintain a seven bedroom house anymore for a long time. I'm willing to buy a nice townhouse on the river. And and I think there's a number of friends that I've talked to and so forth that need to. Sell eight tunnels today. That's what you say. 100. 
And behind that, between that and the road, then uh, put the housing for the workers and so forth. There, there, uh, so to me, it would be a, uh, maybe a split. We could develop what if we have some developer that specializes in you know the condos and so forth. They all that's all they want us to develop back there. Split that off and get that developed. Any more thought on that? Yeah, my thought is no matter what we do, we want to create growth. Yeah. But we want to create growth that we can afford. And we've got to keep that in mind all the time. Correct. Right. Because the taxpayer has got to live with them. Thank you. I think that leads to what David was talking about. If we try to in there, if we do it progressively versus uh, you know, a lump sum, we can, we can do this portion. And, and grow into it, which has been well also, and, and maybe it's harder to be able to. We obviously know, we, we know we don't know a lot right now. We've learned how much we don't know. I think this can help us grow into it. I'd be interested in somebody else, like Bob, or what do you think? I think the apartments over on the river, I mean, it's still even for the river. I think it's going to be a lot of the tall houses that we have on here, we can have maybe some condos in there, whatever with the rent. Maybe it's a combination. That's a pretty, pretty just good thing. Why do you have to say? I have a question. How do the council members? Do you guys understand the difference between a townhouse and a condo community? Yes. I'll just take a couple seconds and I'll read the differences. What exactly is a townhouse? <clears throat> townhouse or townhome is a single family home that shares one or more walls with other independently owned units. They are often rows of uniform homes, two stories or taller, residents own their interior and exterior walls, lawn and roof, as well as the insurance for both their home and property. Maintenance costs for their home determined by the community's homeowners association. That's townhouse. Condo. A condo is a condominium, is a single building or a community of buildings with separate units owned by individual residents. Condos can vary in size or style, ranging from individual homes to high rises, whether it's, that's it, that's all I got. Is that your comment? Yeah, that's all I got. That's I just saying, for example, our committee went down to Oshkosh one night. We viewed some buildings, some of you guys and one of the things we didn't like about that property it was cheaply built. You go through, everything was cheap. The cupboards right that were installed were cheap. Uh, the uh, layout was cheap in the whole price, like, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And when we came back from that, one of the comments they had was, well, we were not impressed with that developer for prime property, you know, for the, the cheaper or whatever, but then prime. But, and, but because the developer doesn't put a lot of, of uh, costs or uh, money into that, they don't have to charge as much rent. So the rental was fairly cheap. Compare that to, for example, some of the, the uh, what you were just talking about in terms of the higher development properties. Uh, that, for example, I'd be interested in I can afford a higher uh, uh, rent monthly maintenance costs or service costs, or whatever, that'd be very willing to pay for a very nice home. Because I have a nice home now, and I'm not interested in going into, a, say, a cheap home. Uh, um, I'd like to have a very nice home. I'm willing to pay for it. And I think there's a number of people down there like it. And to get the maximum value from that property, rather than put up a bunch of cheap houses, I think we have to have a combination of item 
more expensive townhouse, whatever you want to call it, that would appeal to, let's say, richer people, right? People that can afford higher rents and so forth. And then behind that, uh, where it doesn't face the river, I think they could put the, the cheaper housing, lower rents, and would attract workers that is not afford this, this high rent to uh, purchase it and not afford to buy the same thing. So that to me, it does try to get that combination of two different types of housing that I was proposing for that property. So there's three or four different types. As opposed to, for example, what uh, I'll call cheap housing on the entire property. Uh, to me, it, the, the, uh, it's only a limited amount property where you can do and I'm willing to pay a free. In fact, I do pay it. I pay $2,500 to buy a property that is $2,500 higher because I want to do it. I'm the same thing here as most I just live over here. Yes. Dave, I'd like to add to what you were just talking about. Um, I sat with Chad and we discussed some properties he recently went and, and looked at with his wife, took some pictures and stuff, and then kind of discovered that you guys all went there and looked at them when they were being developed. I uh, think that's the same thing you're talking about. And it's set up the same way. Um, I'll turn it over to Chad, but he had some pretty nice pictures of, of how that was set up, of a riverfront as well with the river walk and stuff. Pretty much the same thing that we have down there already. So I was just going around, we were down in Oshkosh, and I think Dave can confirm that these are the apartments that you were talking about, but I was just kind of, I wanted to see um, housing units with the trail next to the river and how that relationship worked out with each other. So this was just down in Oshkosh, and sorry, I wasn't ready to present anything, so I mean, I was just kind of going through all these pictures, but you can see they've got you know the docks, public docks, but from my understanding that they had three different developments, and one was, in my opinion, probably market rate apartments that probably, in my mind, would tease more towards the millennial people. You know, I mean, this seems like something more the um, younger um, generation would be, you know, attracted to. But you can kind of just see, and this, I, I don't think this is more townhouse, I think this is more apartments, you know, per se. You know, whether this would be on the front or back side, but you can kind of see that. You know, they did a really nice job just butting it right up to the river. You know, would this be the more the market high, high rent um, apartments or is likely? And then, Dave, does this look familiar? Were these the apartments that you guys looked at? Um, yeah. 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 I mean, they look pretty nice, but I don't remember acquiring photos of that. They just took the tour. No, it wasn't on the council, but we did a story on it. And they were like duplex almost. And the backs, the way that that developer wanted to do it is the garages in the backs of the house would be facing the river. And I know then at the time they are making and, and a lot of these folks, council members, that said no, they don't want that. This looks like the front is facing the river. I mean, yeah, the they were they were they were only they weren't even two story. I was like, I'd like to point out in this too, though, there the some of the higher ends compared to the apartment style buildings. One was set port more towards the river to showcase, like what like, what you just expressed, and the other one set back. Um, I just didn't want to lose that that train of thought in, in our process here because I think you guys are on the boat. And then I think we discussed something that the developer of this right there in that. Well, this was this one was a senior living. The, the third apartment or the third complex was a senior living one. So I, I don't know what the second one was. Uh, I think the first one, obviously, in my mind, would have been market rate apartments right there. But um, I kind of had plans to go down by you know. Other river fronts that have, I just want to see the trail because that's what we have the river, the trail, and how that the uh, housing 
in relationship to that was I really think this kind of turned out is a really nice concept. But whether this works for our situation, I don't know. Um, and I sent, did, did you guys look at that video I sent from uh, Casey um, from Shadrishkis? Um, Todd mentioned about Shadrishkis. This was a video that Casey, our video producer, when he worked for Big Cheese, um, they did a video um, called Urban West. And this is a you know, fairly you know, nicer complex, but this gives me the feeling for, um, this. This gives me the feeling of a millennial type, you know, situation and pick up on some of the amenities. And they also talked about that this company does what Todd was talking about, you know, with trying to link um, businesses with that, that um, housing and then the, the, the deposits and everything like that. They talk, they all talk about all that. The Urban West, a new career property by SC Swiderski, provides you with the ultimate living experience in Wausau. Urban West has what you've always been looking for in apartment living. All the comfort with the extra amenities you enjoy. You'll be able to select from seven different floor plans, from studios to two bedroom units. Each floor plan provides a more modern and upscale setting than other apartments in the area. Urban West Living includes full access to an outside fitness room, a community room with a full kitchen, and underground parking. High speed Wi Fi, cable, heat, and water are also included. Urban West also hosts a bike share program and private laundry in each apartment. Urban West is also a great way to attract and retain employees. SC Swiderski offers area employers quality housing for employees with programs that include all inclusive pricing. Special rates and British housing. Find the ultimate living experience at Urban West in Wausau. Learn more at scswinnerski.com. So that was one video that Casey brought up that he worked on. I just thought it was kind of interesting. That just screamed millennials and, and that mark that that clientele that that's what we're going for. You know, they have a housing and they have the fitness room and they've got the bike share program and those are the type of things that is that going to be attractive to those that clientele. Um, like I said, I don't know if this would work in downtown London, but I think those are some of the concepts that you can think about uh, with that. So, so moving on, we are in agreement that we are going to have to do a TIF district. That's how we want to develop this. Jody, what's your recommendation? I don't want to see we committed. I want to develop. All right. So my suggestion would be a pay pay as you go, Ted. Correct. I'll be talking to Phil Cosson here too to talk about. Um, I know we had talked a little bit on a smaller group about um, going slowly at the development and developing over time. So what that allows is for um, one development to get that revenue stream started, and then you can utilize those revenues to help with the next process and and um, also to help with the infrastructure. So. Um, uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to Phil, but I'm going to talk to him and see if he has any e examples of communities that have worked through the slow process of slowly developing a parcel. But yes, I would, yes, my my recommendation will be a TIF, yeah. TIF district pay as you go, a pay go. So then that uh, leaves us with uh, considering a, a planner and going into our next meeting. We think that's where we're, we're sitting. I think we've got an idea of what we want out there. And our next step is visualizing it. Any ideas of uh, how, you, how we want to go about doing that? Want to take that upon our our new city administrator, one of your committee members would like to put that on. Scott Hutchinson, would you uh, tell now and tell the contract and help us with that? I'm, I'm sorry, I guess, but with help with what? 
help with finding a, a, a planner to, to design oh. some specs out there. Um, sure, yeah. We'll bring that to the next meeting. Okay, yeah. Any further discussion on, on line item four? And who pays for that plan? City does? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we're. we're... Why don't um, I suggest that um, we have this little committee we're talking about, Judy's um, TIF program or TIF policy? Why don't that little group we put this on there too? Because it's obviously the the financing and how we finance this and that's a great job for having a smaller committee to kind of talk about that and bring up a proposal forward. So maybe that's the second item on that little group that we have together. Everybody okay with that? Any other discussion on line item four? Here none, we'll move on to line five, update and proposal consideration from the Duluth Public Library. Where's Dan? Uh, actually, Ron will be speaking as the president of the library board. Uh, he's coming right back. Okay. So, where would you like to sit? Okay. All right. We everybody. I'm Ron Steinhorst, president of the Library Museum Board and uh, fundraising chairman for uh, our library. And tonight, with the efforts of our fundraising committee, which are present, uh, I'd like to share a little bit about, A, the background of where we have been and the direction of where we now see ourselves going. You'll be getting a copy of this after I finish the presentation uh, so that you can take it home that you will have actual reference to what's going to be in the material. Okay, so you don't need to take notes, John. If you don't. <laughs> okay. So for the past 20 years, the New London Library Museum Board has considered the updating or construction of a new library. Among the considerations of concern at that time were for additional space, ADA accessibility, meeting rooms for the community, limited parking, and expanded programming. In 2008, I personally saw the opportunity to purchase the building at 401 South Pearl Street, building the Venice Caesars Trophy Shop as a kickstart to a building project. Von Fry with the firm of Gil and Marlinaro was hired to do a space needs study, resulting in a suggested 25,000 square foot structure. Shortly thereafter, the Staskills purchased the adjacent site at 405 South Pearl, that was Denny's supermarket, to be included in the building project. 
After a period of time, the buildings were raised. Unfortunately, concerns regarding financing altered that project, and the site has been used for parking since that time. Forward to 2017, when Randy Stadmiller, a former New London farmer and current developer, proposed developing the riverfront property, an area that had stood vacant for 20 years despite having been listed for sale or development uh, by Bomir Real Estate at that time. Stadmiller's plan called for the construction of a 20,000 square foot building with a library on the ground floor and senior housing on the top two floors. Market rate housing on the remainder of the property would complete that vision. This proposal resolved two problems, an answer to the library's needs and a boost to an economic development in a blighted downtown area. Stan Miller shared his proposal with members of the community in an informational meeting. Enthusiasm abounded and a fundraising committee was formed to raise the required $3 million. All was going well until a postponed meeting with Mr. Stadmiller because of the mayor's absence in March of 2019, and then the unexpected illness of Stadmiller without someone to take his place brought our fundraising to a halt. Community members continue to ask, what's going on with the library? What is the city contributing to the project? We unfortunately could not answer those questions because we could not get a firm commitment from the council. Additionally, the former city administrator chose to not fulfill our request several times to have this issue on the council agenda. Consequently, fundraising has stopped after we having gained approximately $1.5 million in donations and pledges. In the interim, we continue to ask the City Council for a developer and a plan. Nothing. Frustrated with a lack of support, our fundraising committee began looking at other options. What could the future hold? This is when we discovered a new trend in libraries, not with books, but with technology. The so-called e-library, the electronic library, focuses on computers, Wi-Fi access, and maker space with fabrication labs. This supports exploration with hands-on learning for the future job markets and would allow us to partner with local industries in the area of electricity, plumbing, welding, carpentry, in other words, the trades. The school superintendent supports this concept and sees it an extension of the student's education. This flexible new structure would be located on the vacant lot across from the present library. The existing library will continue to operate as is. Let me repeat that. The existing library will continue to operate as is. Also under discussion within this new facility will be a STEM lab, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, a teen center, private study rooms, collaborative workspace, a large meeting room with an adjacent kitchen, and a computer center. Sensing that the original library concept did not have city support, our committee proceeded to interview five design-build contractors for the new technology-based approach. We met with Balin Builders, McMahon, Huffman, Bolt, and Keller. The fundraising committee felt Keller offered the best fit for the project. We presented this to the library board on Monday, April 10th, August 10th, 
and Keller was unanimously approved for hire. We trust that the city will support us in this project, and we know the council had asked for a dollar amount. While we do not have a finite number at this time, we know that we will need an operational support and we are working with Keller at this time to develop the budget. Once we have that budget, we will be back to discuss the city's contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a contribution and a cutting edge for putting New London on the map as a thinking community to enhance education and economic development. It will be one of the very first in the entire state that has this facility. We look forward to the city's support and partnership on this new and exciting venture. So that is our proposal as we're looking at it right now. Uh, and I guess we would entertain any questions and I would ask our fundraising committee to help with any responses that you might have at this point. Oh, Go ahead, David. Sounds very exciting, 100% behind it. And as I understand, you've tied in with the local businesses to see how they can cooperate with you or work with you or with this new. We've already talked with several of them. Yes, they are excited. Northland Electric, for example, is jumping at the guns of being able to get involved with this type of thing. Also, in our interviews that we had with uh, the five builders, one of the things that we firmly stressed was we wanted to make as much use of New London industries and opportunities to purchase products here as opposed to the Valley. And uh, Keller definitely was on board with that game as well. I one see of the that. reasons why they selected. We said right. a, a real draw for new businesses as well, the training has to Well, right, and we're looking at, I mean, this. This could begin as well in, in the middle school area, middle age school area level to spark those kinds of interests. Uh, and that's growing into what's the job market looking for today is basically that. You mentioned that earlier in our meeting. It's the fact, you know, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted, but we need some of that skilled labor. And by getting these students, younger people inspired early on, we might have something that will draw people back to New London. Have you uh, contacted Foxlight Capital? We have, yeah, we talked to them as well. Uh, purposely, when we were talking about maybe even the idea of an incubator restaurant or something in there, of course, that involves then getting into uh, the stainless steel, and you know, there's a lot more that's involved. They could not always guarantee that they might have someone that would be able to be there operating it and so on. But yes, we have talked and they were also very inspired by this idea. Mm -hmm. Outstanding idea. That is that is looking into the future. Well, this is the thing is, you know, all of a sudden it was one of our members that discovered this article. It was in Texas, right, Lori? Yes, it was in Texas where this had first begun. And then we found lots of articles that talk the new trend in libraries. And particularly when you're getting some of the arguments from people that say, well, books aren't important anymore because we were hearing that from some individuals. Well, they are for some and maybe not so much for other, but you know, we're not living in the dinosaur age, we're looking in the space age, the future age. And that's what our goal is at this point. That's an exciting idea to get behind. Thank you. Questions? I have a comment and a question. Yeah, go ahead, Hans. Uh, real quick comment. Um, I'm not sure if this is kind of what you were talking about with the kitchen space, but I had personally looked into trying to find a commercial kitchen space that could be rented for somebody that was trying to develop either a catering business or something <laughs> along those lines. And um, it was very difficult to find. I, I could not find it in New London, a kitchen that you could rent by the hour or use daily during a certain period of time to prep food, et cetera. So I'm not sure if that's kind of 
part of the discussion, but I think that'd be really cool. The question is, um, are there, as part of this plan, any considerations for the museum? The museum would obviously have to follow through once we have this, I mean, this has always been, and we're always talked about it in terms of the phases, and we have to deal with one phase before we can get into the second. And I don't want to certainly encumber having two different fundraisings going on at the same time, because then you're getting a breaking up as far as people are concerned and so on. Let's get one project done and then go for the second project. Is there an opportunity to just add another floor and throw a museum on top? Who's gonna pay for that? <laughs> I mean, if, if you have the money, sure. I mean, we're hoping to fundraise most of the money for this project. Um, so since we're at 1.5 now, we think that this is an exciting project that more people who we've talked to maybe in the past and haven't been as excited about, you know, the old library, we think that they will come forward and maybe uh, support this project. I think there's other people that we haven't talked to yet um, that may support it. I, I think there's a lot more opportunities. So uh, we're hoping that most of this is going to be paid by fundraising. Of course, we don't have the budget yet. Um, and that's our next step. We're meeting with Keller uh, next Wednesday to start the process of putting the floor plan. To, in order to get to the fundraisers, we always have to have, you have to have something to show them. We could talk about it, but it'd be nice to have pictures and the floor plan and all that. So if you guys got a couple million hiding that we don't know about. <laughs> I'd like to know about that. Yeah, <laughs> we'd all like to know about that. Mr. Barrington? Um, until you get a floor plan, you probably do not know how much space you need, or do you have a rough idea how much space? No, we know that that space across the street is about 28,000 square feet. Okay. We're not intending to use, obviously, we're not intending it to be 20,000 because we found out that's a $5 million project. So it's going to be uh, much smaller than that. We don't know yet. Uh, we have Keller on their on their staff as an interior designer as well as an architect, and so they put it together. Um, and, and you can't use the traditional space needs, which is you know forty thousand books. And you put them on this many shelves. So I think the way that we're going to have to figure out the space needs is more like how many people do we think are going to be in those areas at one time. So the teams, so we definitely we want a team space because we have no team space. Um, so you got to think, okay, is there going to be 25 or 30 kids in there? And then what activities are they going to be doing? And that's what this architect is going to help us do. That, that will give us an idea of the size of the space. But you're almost saying you think you've got enough space there now. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And hopefully with the city giving us a break on purchase. And it also probably will have a lot of flexibility in, with the interior, for example, with large meeting room, which we can just have like some dividing curtains or something and actually maybe have three meetings going on at the same time. It's a possibility. I don't know how many of you have ever seen that large meeting room that's out of North and Electric. They fell in love with that when I saw it, you know. Well, they, that seats about 100 people, but they have a counter the entire distance of the one wall. Where they and he said we've had weddings out here. We've served, you know, bridal showers, baby showers. So you know, there is this need in the community for places for people to go, of varieties of activities and so on. So we meet those needs as well as team needs, definitely, and technology needs. In other words, this becomes a community center. I can think. Uh, adding on to Ron's flexibility idea, I mean, makerspace and bad labs are all the rage right now. But maybe in 10 years, nobody cares about those. So the space has to be able to be transferred into something else. You can transform it, use that space into whatever the next next new great thing is. 
So we're really, really interested in making a flexible space. And those those uh, plumbing electricity things, we're thinking, you know, those could trade out every six months or something. So you get an electrician who wants to come in and show kids how to whatever how the electricians work, and then you then the plumber comes in and, and gives them that trade idea so that it's a it's a rotating um, kind of space. That's the picture in our head. We'll see how it comes out. I definitely would like to recognize you guys for thinking outside the box and, and really pushing forward with that, not, not letting your vision and ideas stall enough. Well, we're not going to say that. Let's put it that way. <laughs> We've been doing this ever since when, my God, the last 10 years, I think at least, you know, meeting together every other Wednesday for several hours, and we continue to do so. Uh, and that's dedication in terms of. Uh, the people who are on that staff. And I'm going to ask Joe and Lori if they will hand out, please, uh, a copy of what I just presented to you so that you have your own personal copy that you can go back through rooms again and, uh, you know, cogitate it, think about it, and uh, particularly the latter portion where we're showing you the proposal for what's coming. And being excited about you guys' idea that you set forth, um, we, we, as a city, obviously set through our meetings, thank you, um, in the development of this riverfront project. This is something that gives council, I'd like them to recognize, we have a new aspect that we can look at too to complement what you guys are doing there and work together with each other. It gives another road of ideas and avenues to go down to complement each other on that. I'm happy in a way that we discovered this new idea because now we're going to be trend setting as opposed to doing same old, same old. Absolutely. So sometimes I guess there are blessings in disguise. Absolutely. You want to call it that question. A comment and then a question. Ron, three years ago, you sat right there where Mr. Gorski is sitting. And this library project came up again. And at that point, you announced that uh, the city had been debating it for 15 years at that time. So it's 18 years that this has been going on. And I think. Uh, after a number of missteps, a number of situations that were beyond anybody's control, the uh, uh, a new and exciting way of pursuing it has been uh, devised, and I think deserves the support of everyone. Uh, and on the continued fundraising. Uh, activities. Am I correct in assuming that there will be an until you have these further uh, plans, uh, site plans, that sort of thing, in, or, or pictures of whatever? Yes, I mean, we have um, chosen to spoke to, uh, we have spoken to our major donors. So we're the $100,000 and above people so that we could tell them about this project and sense their uh, approval or disapproval. I mean, the, the last thing we want to do is lose any of the money that we gain, you know, that right. we have. So we wanted to, to uh, talk to them before we really decided to go forward. And then, yes, we have to have something, you have to have some kind of picture to show people. Oh, you want to show us. You want to show us. So, so, you know, I, I'm hoping that in six to eight weeks at the top, tip top, and I hope it's faster than that, Kelly will have some. Great. Well, oh, Ron, if you can't ask for money without giving them something, right. Right. Yeah. It's, hard, it's difficult to imagine what it would be. Right. So, are the Tyson, the CO teams, and Port Northland Electric, and the banks on your list? Uh, yes. Thank 
congratulations, Library. I, I, that's a pretty unique in, uh, in vision. I wish you the best of luck, and, and hopefully we can continue relations working together, both for your project and our project, and, and complement each other on that. We will try to keep you updated as soon as we have something which develops, and we will just continue to ask your uh, ongoing support. That's Absolutely. that's the most important thing for us because there have been days when we've been very discouraged, but we said, "No, this is going to happen," and it is. But you know, I'm going to hit eighty next year. <laughs> I can't wait forever to turn nineteen. <laughs> Any further questions about the library update? With none, we'll move on to the line six public comment. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, we'll move on to the interview. Move the interview. Motion made, second, and all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 